This week on the Backtable Podcast. How I think about it too is all those trials were designed for patients with a short PSA doubling time. So they were designed for patients with a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months, given data from former studies that suggested that the risk of developing metastases when the PSA gets like that is, is really high. I think that's certainly a consideration for those individuals who have a short doubling time. But, you know, I think for people that may have a doubling time on the order of two or three years, they weren't necessarily captured on those studies. But absolutely. And I think the choice between which agent to use, because the efficacy data is all pretty equivalent. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. This discussion is brought to you by Verisite, provider of the Decipher Prostate Genomic Classifier. Decipher Prostate is a test for patients with localized prostate cancer that can help personalize treatment. Every patient and their prostate cancer is unique, and Decipher Prostate can provide meaningful insight into the aggressiveness of each individual's patient's tumor. Because the Decipher score is derived solely from the genomic characteristics of the tumor, it provides information not available through already known clinical and pathologic factors. Decipher high-risk patients generally benefit from earlier or intensified treatment, while decipher low-risk patients may be ideal candidates for monitoring or less overall treatment. Decipher prostate is the most validated gene expression test in localized prostate cancer, with level 1 evidence in national clinical practice guidelines and more than 70 peer-reviewed publications, including more than 65,000 patients. Visit verisite.com slash decipher to learn more. Now, back to the show. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Raina McKay from UC San Diego. Raina is one of my dear friends and partners here. Always a pleasure to spend some time. How are things going, Raina? Oh, going awesome. It's great to be here with you, Aditya. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm really excited to dig into this topic. I was kind of reminiscing and reflecting a little bit. When I started residency, management of prostate cancer is pretty straightforward. You gave everybody ADT. And when that stopped working, you, you kind of sent them on to the medical oncologist and there wasn't a lot of options. And then I think it was around 2012, Charted came out and Stampede came out and just everything started changing. And it's just been this like super exciting time. Does that sound about right, that the landscape of prostate cancer changed over the course of yours and my career? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hormone-sensitive disease, it was just straight ADT alone. Like, there was not even a thought to do anything other than ADT alone. And really, it was like the charted data and stampede data were first presented, you know, really asking a pretty simple question that just actually changed totally what we do. And the simple question was, well, we use docetaxel for metastatic hormone-sensitive disease, or we use it for metastatic castration-resistant disease, and can we just use it for metastatic hormone-sensitive? I mean, very simple question. There's nothing fancy about docetaxel. And when we did that, we dramatically improved survival for patients, more so than we've done with any other drug that was approved for castration-resistant disease. It was pretty remarkable. And I think then that just set a cascade in place to look at other drugs in the metastatic castration-sensitive setting, you know, moving in abiraterone, enzalutamide, now the other AR inhibitors, you know, apalutamide. And now we're moving PARP inhibitors, other th which are getting tested, you know, lutetium is getting tested in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting. So it's just really changed what we do in clinical practice. Yeah. I literally remember that the answer to like any new therapy in metastatic GU cancers, whether it's kidney, bladder, prostate, was the survival advantage was always four months. That, that was always the right answer. And then like Charted and Stampede came and you saw these like 17 month improvements in survival and it was just mind blowing. Well, you know, as all of this has come through, I think it's probably worthwhile to maybe get some of the terminology down to kind of organize how we think about this. That, that's what's kind of worked for me. And so the first kind of clinical state I think about is metastatic castrate naive or castrate sensitive prostate cancer. You mind just kind of sharing your, your thoughts or defining that? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of terms that are out there, you know, metastatic hormone sensitive disease, metastatic castration sensitive disease. The term castration, I think in general, is just not a friendly term for our patients and in the community. What is defined by metastatic hormone sensitive disease 
is disease that in the context of having a castrate testosterone level, whether that be because of orchiectomy or medical castration, the disease is put in check. The PSA is responding. The imaging is responding. Yeah. So that's the definition of metastatic castration sensitive. Do you consider de novo metastatic prostate cancer to be inherently castrate sensitive or would you call that castration naive and we don't know yet? Well, I think when people are first diagnosed, we, not to say give them the benefit of the doubt, we, we, we test. I think de novo disease is different than patients that present with localized disease and then they end up developing metastases. Multiple series have demonstrated that de novo prostate cancer has worse outcomes than patients that kind of uh, have a, a metachronous presentation. And so, but I, I don't think the term, you know, we use castration naive, but I think we kind of give people the benefit of the doubt and start them on hormone therapy and they're castration sensitive until proven otherwise. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Okay, good. So we have our kind of castrate sensitive. Then the next disease state that I think about is non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. You know, it's becoming an interesting space because historically we used to define the presence of metastases. All of these trials that were done define the presence of metastases based off of conventional imaging. You know, it was positive bone scan, positive CT scan, and that is what defined metastatic disease. With the advent of PET imaging, initially sort of axiom and choline, and, and now really what's taken over is PSMA PET, we have identified sort of a disease entity of negative on conventional imaging, positive on PSMA PET. And we don't really quite know what to do with that patient population, quite honestly. I think those are the conversations at Tumor Board that we have the most, you know, back and forth on because there's really not level one evidence to guide what to do. The reason why I'm highlighting that is the NMCRPC space, the non-metastatic castration resistant, which historically was people who had biochemically recurrent disease. Maybe they were on intermittent ADT. And in the context of being on ADT, their PSA started to rise and you scan them and their scans are negative, but they're clearly resistant because they've got a rising PSA on, on androgen deprivation therapy. That space in the context of PSMA PET imaging is shrinking because a lot of times when you scan patients and they've got a rising PSA on ADT, you find things. So I don't think yet as a field, we've been able to, you know, there are trials that are looking at answering this question, but right now we don't really know how to overlay the PSMA PET defining of metastatic disease versus conventional imaging defining of metastatic disease. Yeah, if I was a strategic planner for industry, my priority area would not be non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer because I think that that space is shrinking and shrinking. Yeah. And and that leads us to our final disease state that I think about, which is metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Yeah. And I think that is really, you know, that is lethal prostate cancer, basically. You know, the majority of individuals who have castration resistant disease ultimately end up passing away from prostate cancer. So that's where there's a huge unmet need to continue to develop advanced therapeutics and prevent people from developing castration resistance and better therapies for castration resistant disease. And metastatic castration resistant disease is basically a rising PSA on um, androgen deprivation in the presence of METs on conventional imaging and or new radiographic METs on conventional imaging. And there are actually criteria through the Prostate Cancer Working Group that actually numerically kind of define what that means. PSA greater than two, that's rising two or more new lesions on bone scan if you're just looking at bone scan alone. And then of course, like sort of resist progression criteria. Those criteria are more for clinical trials. They, they are applicable to clinical practice, but they're really to help define thresholds for clinical trials. Okay. And do you, do you consider less than 50 or less than 20 to be castrate? Do you have any opinions on that? So I guess technically it's less than 50. And I think the reason why that is, is I, I think that that was when a lot of drugs were being approved for castration resistant disease. That's sort of like where the FDA set this threshold of castration resistance is 50. But I agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, the androgen receptor pathway is so important in prostate cancer. And even in the context of castration resistant disease, we continue to blast away at the androgen receptor pathway and think of strategies to further suppress testosterone, to further inhibit the pathway. And that's why drugs like abiraterone and zalutamide 
you know, now we've got AR degraders that are being tested. Technically, lutetium targets PSMA, which is the androgen regulated gene, continue to be effective for this disease. Perfect. So, you know, maybe we'll just kind of walk through each of those disease states over the course of the chat today. So obviously the backbone of all of this is androgen deprivation therapy, which has also gone from, you know, Lupron and bicalutamide to a lot more. And, you know, maybe the way I think about it, you know, we have our GNRH agonist, we have our GNRH antagonist, and then we have our anti-androgens and orchiectomy, which is obviously not a popular option in the U.S. Is that how you kind of group this, Reina? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think technically... The anti-androgens are non-castrating therapy, like by themselves, they're non-castrating. They actually raise testosterone levels instead of drop testosterone levels. So I think, you know, when I think of castration therapy, I think of drugs that drop T. I think of the GnRH agonist, antagonist. And there's been a little bit of excitement recently around those drugs with the advent of Relagolix based off of the results of the HERO trial. It's actually the first oral antagonist to be FDA approved. I think historically we've used agonists in the clinic. There's also some data. I think it's pretty controversial data around cardiovascular effects between agonists and antagonists. And I think when I look at all the data in aggregate, there is a trial called the uh, PRONOUNCE trial that looked at trying to compare Degarelix to Lupron, Luprolide, and really trying to look at cardiovascular outcomes. You know, the trial had to close early because of accrual, but in the context of the trial, everybody was getting aggressive cardiovascular management, both people in the Luprolide arm and people in the, you know, Degarelix arm. And even though the trial was cut short, there really was no difference in outcomes. And I think what the message that has driven home to me is that preventative strategies when done well work regardless of whatever ADT backbone you're using, whether it's Relagolix or whether it's Luprolide or whether it's Degarelix. But those are sort of the key options in the in the frontline like for ADT, you know, it's thinking about the agonist, the antagonist, and when to use them. I, I rarely utilize antiandrogens alone. There's very unique scenarios when I would do that. And I think in the current era, barring use in the localized setting with the, you know, maybe if you're doing concurrent chemo or concurrent radiation with ADT, I'm not really using first generation antiandrogens in the metastatic setting. Yeah. I mean, kind of the way I think about it is, you know, our GnRH agonist, Lupron is kind of a workhorse. Pros are you can get three, six month depots. Downsides are you're kind of committed to a, you know, three to six month androgen deprivation state. So maybe not perfect for intermittent ADT. The GnRH agonist, so this would be Degarelix, Aberelix, Relagolix, as you mentioned. Pros are, you know, if they're coming in de novo with METs, certainly spinal METs, you can get castrate without having to worry about the flare phenomenon that we see with LHRH, antiandrogens, you know, limited kind of mono role, limited role combination, actually. But again, if you have some patients that you're worried about the flare phenomenon, then you can block them as you as you move into Lupron or whatever. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think those patients that present with obstructive urinary symptoms or patients that present with, you know, near cord compression, you know, those are the ones that I'm really reaching for a GnRH antagonist and having them do that for a couple of months. And once they're castrate, kind of later transitioning them to an agonist. Absolutely. So, you know, ADT, it's kind of one of those things, right? It's like a necessary evil. It's so effective, yet it's got its whole host of side effects. It's kind of, you know, it's like, I don't know, I, I deal with a lot of testis cancer. It's like the platinum chemotherapy is highly effective, but it could do X, Y, and Z. And there's this litany of things you kind of run by the patient. You mind just sharing your kind of ADT spiel. Yeah. When you're talking to somebody, you're like, all right, you know, we're going to start out with Lupron. You know, what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So I think the first thing is sort of identifying the class of agent. So, you know, I, I think we historically say, you know, this is sort of a type of hormonal agent, but it kind of is a misnomer because we're not giving you hormones. We're actually working to suppress your hormones. And the key side effects related to the drug are related to actually the side effects of the low testosterone state rather than the actual drug itself. Like the injection can maybe cause a little bit of site reaction rarely, but the, it's not really the drug itself that's causing these side effects. It's rather the low testosterone state. And the major side effects of sort of a low testosterone state kind of are akin to, you can almost envision sort of a male menopause, you know, of low testosterone. So that would be fatigue, hot flashes, decreased libido, can affect muscle mass, can affect bone mass or bone um composition. There can be metabolic changes, you know, weight gain, increased fat, less muscle, 
you know, there can be, in addition to the metabolic changes, there can be sort of increase in cholesterol or increased blood sugar, libido, mood changes. But I always preface with the majority of people who are on hormonal therapy are able to continue living their lives and continue to work and continue to be active. And not everybody gets all of these symptoms. And these symptoms, when they come on, they generally are not limiting with regards to their impact on normal daily life function. You know, I've certainly had patients who've been on ADT who have like continued to thrive on ADT, you know, continue to go to the gym, exercise. You know, sometimes I think some individuals have done so amazingly well, they're so fearful of getting these side effects that they sort of up the ante and they're building muscle on ADT. It can happen. So I think out of all of the therapies that I think that we use in the context of treating cancers from all the chemotherapies and other sort of more advanced agents, you know, the ability to be able to maintain, you know, that high degree of function on therapy that's highly effective is actually a really good thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that sounds very similar. And, you know, I, many times I'm seeing patients with localized disease and I, I don't want to completely color their opinion of ADT in such a negative way so that radiation seems like a non-option, you know, if they have unfavorable intermediate or a high-risk prostate cancer. But I also want to be real. And I think one of the things that you mentioned are, in my opinion, it's, it's actually an opportunity to empower the patients. You know, take like bone loss, you know, that, hey, if you engage in weight-bearing exercises, we search on some vitamin D and calcium and get a both baseline DEXA scan. You know, this is a mitigatable side effect. Or, or as you mentioned with, you know, the cardiovascular toxicity, sexual function, let's get you in with a men's sexual health counselor and a lot of these things are actually quite manageable. And um, I know that, you know, you, you did a really nice job kind of putting together our ADT intro intake kit. And um, for a backcountry urologist, vitamin D, a calcium and, and a DEXA scan, is that a reasonable place to start? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Education, I think, is key around people starting ADT. Just, you know, and I think there's actually a lot of really great support networks for patients through the Prostate Cancer Foundation and other prostate cancer support groups. And I think sometimes just there can be a, like a fear factor, but sometimes just even talking to an individual who's gone through it and has, you know, a middle of the road experience is probably a really good thing. And certainly in the localized setting, usually the treatment is given for a short period of time and nearly all the side effects are reversible. There's a very small subset of patients who have trouble recovering their T after, AD, after ADT, but I think a lot of times those individuals are starting out with a fairly low T to begin with or have other issues going on. Fair. I mean, obviously we could have a whole conversation about ADT, side effects, mitigating it. You know, some of the things that I, I just, I'd love to pick your brain on this. For hot flashes, I'm a pretty big fan of black cohosh. I think that can be quite effective, which I think is sometimes one of the more bothersome side effects. I think nutrition counseling is also something that, that we maybe could do a little bit of a better job towards in terms of muscle mass preservation. How about any other kind of tips and tricks that you keep in your back pocket for some of the common side effects of ADT that you encounter? No, I think hot flashes. There's certainly other medications, you know, Effexor, Gabapentin, Megase can be used. You know, sometimes it's even lifestyle modifications, you know, sleeping with a fan next to you. I've got one patient who's like, doesn't want to go on any medications. He has a cooling pad in his bed and he just uses that actually. And, and, and that seems to get him through the night. So everybody's a little bit different, but there's certainly a lot of strategies to help with the symptoms. You know, even even sometimes dietary modifications, less caffeine, less, you know, spicy foods sometimes can exacerbate. So everybody's got their different triggers. All right. So, you know, that's going to be kind of the, the backbone and maybe just worth mentioning, I think in all of these disease states, typically here, and I think most other places per standard of care, they would be getting germline testing, meet NCC and criteria for that. And many times we'll initiate tumor sequencing as well, should that be something useful for downstream treatments. All right. So now we're going to jump into it. And let's start out with metastatic treatment naive prostate cancer. And perhaps we could have our, our two index patients. Why don't we just start out with de novo newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer? How are you kind of intaking this patient? What are the kind of critical things? Obviously, looking at the patient's disease characteristics, I think classically trying to understand, are they high volume, low volume disease? What I mean by that is, do they have a lot of bone metastases? Do they have visceral metastases? Do they have liver mats? Do they have lung mats? 
We've already kind of carved out that this is a de novo patient. So that in and of itself is a little bit, I'm thinking a little bit differently about the de novo patients versus the recurrent patients. Do they have pain? Are they symptomatic? You know, is important. Are they about to have cord compression or some pathologic fracture? What are their underlying comorbidities? Do they have cardiovascular comorbidities? Do they have some underlying heart failure type symptoms? Do they already have peripheral neuropathy? So I think these are all the things that, you know, I think about when I have a patient before me as we're strategizing, because there are a couple of different paths to go. I think the one wrong answer here, which was always the right answer 10 years ago, is ADT alone. So ADT alone is not the right answer for anything that we do as a standard of like, I guess there's there's caveats if somebody's got gross contraindications to everything, but it, it's rarely ever the right answer alone for a de novo patient. You know, what's going through my mind is, is this an individual who needs docetaxel? And if it's an individual who I think needs docetaxel, they're very symptomatic, they've got visceral meds, then there's data for actually triple therapy. You know, the data for dosi ADT alone is really not great. And we've demonstrated that ADT dosi Abby, ADT dosi daralutamide improves survival compared to just ADT dosi alone. So I kind of go through that, like, do they need chemo? And then if they do, I'm kind of thinking triple therapy. If they don't need chemo, then you sort of have the option of ADT with an androgen receptor targeting agent. And there's a handful of them to be utilized, you know, abiraterone, apalutamide, enzalutamide. I think in my practice, I tend to have a bias to want to use abiraterone first in general, just because I think that there potentially can be, even though we don't like to use sequential Abby Enza or Abby Apa, there can sometimes be responses to an AR antagonist post Abby where the reverse is not necessarily true. But Abby also comes with its own slew of side effects because it can cause hypertension. It's given with prednisone. It's given, you know, can cause LFT issues. So it's not necessarily for everybody. But that's sort of how I think about it. Okay. It already starts getting a little bit more confusing here. <laughs> and um, so we, we kind of started out a little bit talking about charted and how that was just this kind of, you know, absolute paradigm shifting charted and stampede, you know, the amazing multi-arm, multi-level trial from the UK. So maybe to recap a little bit, we're looking at volume of disease, high volume, low volume. We're looking at performance status and we're looking at symptoms. On the one end of the spectrum, we have our highly symptomatic, reasonable performance status, large volume disease, and they're getting the kitchen sink with triple therapy. We're going to be aggressive here. And that's, okay. and those are our patients where, I guess I kind of think about it as like there's chemo and there's no chemo. Right. So those are going to be our kind of chemo preferred patients. And then we have our no chemo options, which are going to be essentially Abby, enzalutamide, apalutamide. And then radiation therapy, maybe for the sake of completeness. Is that yeah. fair? That is fair. And I, I forgot to mention that I think genomics are beginning to play a bigger role here. I think now with the advent of widespread genomic profiling, really to help guide targeted therapy options for PARP inhibitors and other such th treatments, I do think that the genomics can be quite important. Like if somebody's got tumor suppressor gene loss, P53, RB, P10 loss, has two or more of those kind of alterations, like they're not going to have a hormonally sensitive tumor as, as much as a hundred. So I think, you know, we don't necessarily have level one evidence to say if somebody's got X tumor, do this instead. But I think that though, that's another thing that I think colors my decision. Somebody's got an SPOP alteration, they're going to probably be very sensitive to ADT. And if they lack those other alterations, like I'm going to maybe spare them the chemotherapy. So I think that's becoming to also play into the complexity of treatment decisions for how do you select what to do for a patient. And everybody with MSI, are, are you thinking about possibly checkpoint inhibitors in an early line or, or how does that work? So I think for early line, the data is not, we don't yet have data. So I think in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, I can't say that I'm jumping to give that individual a um, immunotherapy. We actually do have a clinical trial open of dosi. Nevo with darolutamide in the metastatic hormone sensitive settings that so we try to shuttle those patients onto that trial. I think in my practice, it's largely reserved for the castration resistance setting. Okay. And then, um, so radiation, are we going to think about that like as an adjunct typically to the ADT plus something non-chemo? Absolutely. I mean, I think based off of data from Stampede for those low volume disease patients and even 
It was also kind of confirmed in the subset analyses from the HARAD trial, though there was a large number of patients with high risk disease, high volume disease in that trial. But I think in the subset with low volume disease that present with an intact primary, I think there is data to support that radiating the primary actually improves overall survival. And so it's something that I definitely consider. And a lot of patients who present with de novo disease with an intact primary, they may have local symptoms related to their you know, primary being in place. And, and usually it's actually a multidisciplinary discussion. You know, in a DTA, we share a handful of patients with our radiation oncology colleagues where we're kind of strategizing, you know, catheter, TERP, simple prostatectomy, followed by the radiation, you know, because they're obstructed and we want to, you know, treat that obstruction to help improve their quality of life. Totally. So I, I loved your take-home message that, you know, in the 21st century, it's got to be ADT plus something. And, you know, maybe that's just a, a reminder, certainly for us on the urology side, that if you're not comfortable with prescribing medications like abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide, that you probably ought to really engage your medical oncology team uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, fantastic. So, um, and then of course, you know, radiation should be a part of the discussion. And and we, of course, have a, a SWOG study, Brian Chapin study, looking at the role of surgery as well. Fantastic. So de novo, now a little bit Biochemical recurrence. Let's let's talk about that state. So they got a prostatectomy radiation, PSA is climbing, and they've got a lymph node that, that you're worried about. Maybe we'll just kind of leave it as systemic options so we don't get bogged down in all the various, you know, permutations for more local therapy. Okay. If I'm putting somebody in the bucket of biochemically recurrent, they need to not have that lymph node. They need to not have metastatic disease and you know, that's generally my thoughts around that. And I guess we can get really in the weeds between, okay, where is that lymph node? Is it below the aortic bifurcation, above the aortic bifurcation? So technically it's a pelvic node and it's not M1A disease. So technically they wouldn't have been included in the stampede and whatever data. So we can get really in the weeds, you know, for, uh, you know, somebody who's biochemically recurrent with a lymph node in place. I mean, I think not to say we don't necessarily know what to do. I mean, if it's M1A metastatic, there's plenty of data, even low volume disease, continuous ADT with ARSI. Every patient is different. Not everybody wants to escalate lifelong for a long time. So we are always kind of pushing the envelope. You know, I know you don't want to talk about local therapies, but it's, you can't not totally. talk about it. How about, okay, biochemical recurrence, no evidence of METs. When do you start getting a little bit more, obviously, observation and let it kind of get some information, kinetics and so on. When do you start getting a little bit more excited? Everybody is different. So I think there's no, you know, for me, it's based on the absolute number of the PSA, the PSA doubling time, the patient's PSA anxiety slash ADT aversion. The combination of those three factors actually help us decide, okay, this is the trigger point. You know, I've got patients where their PSA is 0.8 and we're starting ADT because it just got there and you know, so quickly, they've got high risk features to begin with. And we're having, you know, we're starting ADT much sooner. I've got patients who've got a PSA in the teens, and we just drag in our feet with a PSA doubling time of almost two to three years. They've been sitting in this state for, gosh, five to eight years. So it really varies. And I do think that patient preference and, you know, really actually factors in. And at the end of the day, we don't have any level one data to say, this is the PSA number that you have to start ADT on. You know, I think generally when I'm starting it, I'm doing about, you know, nine months of therapy and then giving them an off period and hoping that we can get a couple years during the off period before we have to re-challenge again. And that, just to be clear, is ADT monotherapy. Typically ADT monotherapy. Now, there was this trial that was presented at ESMO just last year by Raul Agarwal done through the Alliance called the Presto study that looked at patients with a rapid PSA doubling time of less than 10 months and actually escalated therapy with either apalutamide or apalutamide and abiraterone. And the primary endpoint of the trial was biochemical progression-free survival. And it was a positive trial, but I think the major criticism is, is, is that going to translate into an MFS difference? And is that going to translate into an OS difference? And so I think there is that data that's out there for those super high risk individuals, but I don't know that it is level one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I kind of think about it, you know, you got to meet the patient where they're, where they're at for this one. I mean, some of the people just totally live and die by PSA levels and they just, you know, 
it's a real mega detractor of the quality of life. And I don't like to treat the number. And I think our jobs are to help diffuse some of that anxiety and let people know that they're going to be okay. Natural history, data, all that. I do think that this is maybe a clinical state where some of the GNRH antagonists, specifically Relagolix, where we do see nice recovery of testosterone in a relatively short time frame. A, you know, B, it's kind of highly titratable in terms of on-off periods. And then C, if they happen to be one of those patients that really have the wind taken out of their sales because of ADT, they can, you know, make a little bit of a more nimble decision for themselves. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I think Relagolix does provide options for people. For me, that's the perfect scenario to kind of think about using Relagolix. It's actually in people who don't require long-term continuous ADT. I think Relagolix, even though I know Hero looked at people who needed one year of therapy, I actually think in clinical practice, it's the people who require short course where it's like a really great option for them. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So now we're, maybe we'll shift over to our rapidly shrinking clinical state of non-metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer. And the way I kind of think about this is, all right, so the name kind of describes the clinical state reasonably well. We talked about, you know, advanced imaging and how that's likely going to show some of these smaller occult metastases. But three trials, Prosper, Spartan, Aramis, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, all of them positive trials. That's kind of my armamentarium that I think about in this state. Is that comprehensive? Am I missing anything? No, that's absolutely true. I think how I think about it too is all those trials were designed for patients with a short PSA doubling time. So they were designed for patients with a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months, given data from former studies that suggested that the risk of developing metastases when the PSA gets like that is, is really high. I think that's certainly a consideration for those individuals who have a short doubling time. But, you know, I think for people that may have a doubling time on the order of two or three years, they weren't necessarily captured on those studies. But absolutely. And I think the choice between which agent to use, because the efficacy data is all pretty equivalent. I mean, they're, they're more similar than they are different. You know, I think uh, darolutamide is sometimes tends to be my go-to. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. There's not as much fatigue. There's not as much falls. And so sometimes I think that's a great option for patients. They can do pretty well on it. The quality of life and patient reported outcomes look really good. And seizure risk is non-existent? Really low. And actually in the trial, you know, in uh, Aramis, they actually allowed patients who had, you know, prior seizure, things like that. So I think, which was different than like the enzalutamide study. And so I think the seizure risk is really, really low. Got it. Got it. So that one's to me, a little bit more straightforward. There's three medications. They're all in the same class of medications, reasonable kind of comparable side effect profile. And then of course, you know, our final clinical state, which is more common given the incidence, and this is the one that's responsible for prostate cancer being the leading cause of death in men, is metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So maybe just again, Rain, I'll ask you to, you know, at a high level, what are the kind of intakes when the patient's coming in and you're trying to decide on what comes next? Yeah. So I think the patient factors that I think about for selection of therapy, again, they're very similar to the frontline factors, which is do they have pain or not? What's the pace of their progression? Are they rapidly progression progressing? What have they seen prior is an important one for me. Did they get chemo in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting? Did they get it an ARSI in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting? And how was their response to that? I think here genomics plays an even larger role because now we actually do have PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, Brucaparib, our FDA approved here, Pembrolizumab for MSI high or high TMB is approved. And I think imaging is also dictating eligibility for various treatments with PSMA PET positive disease, directing patients for uh, lutetium treatment. So I think there's a lot that I think about at the patient and disease factor state to help guide what to do. Totally. And that's exactly how I kind of think about it. It's, you know, symptoms, performance status, and then basically pre-post chemo. Maybe we can just kind of use that to organize it a little bit. So let's say chemo naive, minimally symptomatic, good performance status. So if they're chemo naive, you know, I would also ask, did they get an ARSI? If they didn't get an ARSI, then, you know, thinking about drugs like Abby and the and so forth. And I think it's even getting a little bit more complicated with the data from Propel, which looked at the combination of Abby 
and Olaparib in frontline metastatic CRPC in patients not having had received an ARSI in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, demonstrating that the combination actually improves, you know, progression free survival, certainly a, a signal for OS. So I think there's a European approval for the combination of Olaparib and Abiraterone in an unselected population, and we're still waiting on the FDA decision on that. So that's going to complicate things. So I think no prior chemo, if no prior ARSI, then definitely an ARSI with a small caveat around adding a PARP. So I think right now probably most would say no. If they have received an ARSI, it's a little bit of a different story. So if they haven't received chemo, they're still minimally symptomatic. You could still consider chemo. Um, you can consider radium-223 if they've got bone-only disease. If, they've got, if they're minimally symptomatic, you know, you could even consider Provenge in these individuals. You know, I still use it in my practice. I know there's a lot of controversy about Provenge, but demonstrated that it's a life prolonging agent in a phase three study. So it's in the armamentarium. So I think, I do think what they've received previously really impacts what to do next. Yeah. And I mean, I think the populations are going to continue to evolve. There's practice patterns. There's what people do, whether they receive previous Abby ends up another ARSI kind of in the earlier setting. But the kind of maybe standard workhorses are Abby, Enza, selected patients are going to be Olaparib, MSI, selected folks, and then mitoxantrone. No. Is that even a, a thing anymore? I can't remember the last time I used I use it, but I think cabazitaxel is a great second line chemo agent. There's great data for cabazitaxel plus carboplatinum for aggressive variant prostate cancer. So I've used that in my practice. So there's other taxanes that can be used. So I think when I think of the buckets, I think of hormonal agents. And then I think of, you know, those would be your, like you said, your Abby Enza. I think of chemo agents. So those are going to be your dosi cabazi. I think of immunotherapy. That's going to be your Provenge, Pembro in a selected population. I think of radioligand therapy. That's going to be your radium-223 for bone-only patients and lutetium PSMA right now post-chemo and ARSI with PSMA expressing disease. And then I think of your targeted therapies. That's where I lump a lap or, and rucaparib. That's sort of where I, those are the, the buckets, I would say. Fantastic. And maybe just since it's a little bit newer and exciting, tell us a little bit about lutetium. You know, if I, if there's a topic that comes up in my, all my prostate cancer discussions, including grade group one, one core, less than 5%, PSA of four, it's, hey, am I, uh, am I a good candidate for lutetium? Yeah. So uh, lutetium is a radioligand, a targeted radioligand therapy. It targets PSMA, which can be expressed on prostate cancer cells, but is expressed in other areas in the body, like the salivary glands, the liver, endothelial cells. And it's linked to a beta-emitting radioisotope 177 lutetium. And so it targets PSMA cells, binds to the receptor, it gets endocytosed in inside the cell, and basically emits the radiation and there's, you know, a cell kill to the cell and then there's bystander effect to, you know, nearby cells. Right now, it was approved based off of the results of the vision trial, which was a large phase three trial looking at standard of care alone versus standard of care plus lutetium. And I think it's important to understand what the standard of care was. So in the context of vision, about over 80% of patients were getting a concurrent ARSI. So they were either getting Abby or Enza or APA, one of these drugs, not so much APA, probably more Abby, Enza. They may have gotten steroids or palliative radiation, but actually the bulk of these people were on some kind of hormonal agent while they were getting lutetium. And so in my practice, a lot of times I will keep them on a hormonal agent while they're getting lutetium. But based off of the results of this trial, which demonstrated primary endpoint was overall survival, ultimately led to the approval of lutetium in the U.S. And there was actually another trial that I think further supports the data run out of um, Australia called the therapy trial. This trial looked at PSMA positive, FDG PET negative disease and randomized patients to lutetium versus cabazitaxel. And the primary endpoint of this trial was a PSA response. And it was a positive trial, but that further supported the vision lutetium data. But it's not for everybody. I will highlight that the approval in the U.S. right now is post-chemo, but there was a press release a couple of uh, month ago or so from the PSMA-4 trial, which the PSMA-4 trial looked at 
lutetium pre-chemo. That trial is positive. We haven't seen all the data. It's all in press release. But I do think that lutetium is going to move up in the treatment landscape, no doubt, over the next year. And it's even being tested in the hormone-sensitive setting. Yeah, and that'll just make another a bucket in the kind of ever-growing branch point of symptoms, disease burden, pre-chemo, pre-post lutetium, plus or minus a second-generation antiandrogen, which is exciting. It obviously makes it more complex, but it's exciting. And, you know, one of the things, just because we were kind of focusing on the standard of care, it's also, in my opinion, super exciting to see the clinical trials really across disease states that are, you know, seems like they're coming through a million miles an hour and will we'll continuing to shape this landscape for the better health of our patients. You know, one of the things that I think is important for patients are to do their own research, be their own advocates, and really try to understand what's available and make sure that some of the newer standard options are, are also available. Any thoughts on that, Raina? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's critically important um, to know what is in your direct sphere and direct kind of like what's in your own backyard. And I would say, you know, for those patients that are out there, like understanding, you know, where's the closest NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. And, you know, I think here in San Diego, we're the only NCI designated cancer center in the region, kind of below LA, you know, we're the first in the region to bring lutetium to our patients here. So I think it's critically important to know what's in your own backyard. You know, I think what makes NCI comprehensive cancer center, it's not just, you know, one thing, but it's really the comprehensive nature, you know, nutrition, integrative care, social work, all of the ancillary services, access to clinical trials, cutting edge research and cutting edge therapies. And I think that's what we strive to do here at UCSD. Totally. Yeah. I think that's one of those things where pushing the envelopes, bringing in these new treatments. I mean, lutetium is a perfect example, really coordinated effort between nuclear medicine, medical oncology, radiology, to bring them in is not trivial, but a thousand percent super worth it when you get to see the positive results and offer those to our treatments, our patients. Well, hey, Raina, I, um, you know, I love the way that you take something kind of complex and make it digestible. And I certainly learned a lot. Any just kind of final thoughts for the listenership, which is largely going to be urologist when it comes to managing advanced prostate cancer? Yeah, I mean, I think the the field is changing so rapidly. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we're realizing the more complicated treatment of prostate cancer is getting, the more multidisciplinary it's getting. It's like metastasis-directed therapy, use of localized therapy in the metastatic disease. In the localized disease, there's studies of neoadjuvant treatments. And, you know, I think we're becoming ever more multidisciplinary in our approach. So I actually think having sort of your team, your cadre team, you know, of uh, this is sort of my go-to radiation oncologist or med you know, kind of working together to really ensure the patients have the best outcomes is key. Yeah. And maybe I would just add for the urology side that just because the field is evolving and changing, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have an absolutely integral role. And even little things like initiating germline testing, tumor sequencing, providing the patients with some framework of what the next steps looks like, I think can be really empowering and and also just prevent delays with some of the logistics that can occur. Fantastic, Reina. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and expertise and look forward to the next one. Thanks, Aditya. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from... Ishan Sangwan and Vedavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.